Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Sports Insight with your host Alamdar Khan. And yes, as you all know, we always give you information with regards to sports from all across the globe. You guys can surely reach out to us on our social media handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sports. That's basically for the Twitter and Instagram. But anyways, we'll go to the headlines first. Yes, Pakistan captain Babar Azam has continued his impressive run in the ODI cricket by securing the number two spot in the ICC ranking. And yes, Sri Lanka versus West Indies. Sri Lanka were bowled out for 476 in their second innings and Sri Lanka has set the target of 375 runs for West Indies to win. And yes, from the world of golf, DeChambeau and Justin Thomas suffered surprise defeat in the WGC. And from the world of football, Turkey beats the Netherlands 4-2 in the FIFA World Cup 2022 qualifier. And Toronto Raptors win against Denver Nuggets by 135-111. And yes, those were the headlines and definitely talking about cricket. Yes, we'll start up talking more about cricket and as discussed in the headlines, Barbara Azam actually climbed up to the number two spot in the ICC ODI ranking. And to discuss more, obviously, the team is also going for this uh, series against South Africa on the 26th of March. Anyways, to discuss all of the cricket matters, we have with us Tasneem Samar Khan all the way from New Zealand. Tasneem, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Eleanor. <coughs> Great. Uh, anyways, the team will start off with, uh, as uh, as the headline said, that you know Barbara Azam actually managed to come up, climb the number two spot in the ICC and the ODI ranking, and not, not only that, we are also heading to South Africa on the March 26th. How do you see that impact with uh, how Pakistan can be performing with South Africa in South Africa? I think it's a really exciting series. There is a bunch of ODIs, a bunch of T20s. It's a packed series, which is a lot better than a lot of situations where we've seen a couple of games here and there. It really gives Pakistan an opportunity to get stuck in, to get into the conditions, um, to hopefully be able to acclimatize themselves to that excessive bounce that we do get or we do see in South Africa. I think with Babur um, shooting up the rankings and, and continually impressing in all three formats, I think it's a really exciting series for Pakistan. It gives them the opportunity to tour South Africa for a few years and hopefully do a lot better than they fared last time. They'll feel very confident after that series win that we saw in Pakistan. It was very comprehensive. And we will be seeing a very similar South African side for, for this upcoming series as well. So I think Pakistan will feel good. Um, they will have faced their last away tour before this was obviously in New Zealand where they faced a lot of short bowling as well. Right. So they will have practice hopefully with that excessive bounce that South Africa does get. So I think it's all looking good and, and I think one of the biggest things is that extra boost of confidence for the captain. He's number two in the rankings at the moment right. in the ODI rankings. He's not far off Kohli's spot. and. With some serious performances in, in, in this upcoming tour, he could climb up to the number one. However, I think as a captain and as a batsman, you are probably less focused on, on the statistical ranking system and looking more at how you are continually improving and pushing forward your game. This is a very different Bobber that we first saw under under Mickey Arthur years ago. Um, his confidence has come on, his technique has, has stayed solid, and oftentimes with batsmen, who burst onto the scene and are incredibly impressive, it takes just a couple of years before you start to see their weaknesses. Right. Bob Razum is a very interesting batsman because he has no glaring weaknesses as such. Doesn't mean that he's not human, but they're right. not glaring. So I think as a captain, he's going to be feeling incredibly good going into it, and he's going to be thinking about giving Pakistan, as this, a captain, the best performance he can, rather than selfishly, purely thinking about the ranking system. True. That's a very good take on it. And not only that, this time, I think the team itself is super ready. Uh, talking about consistency, I'll just talk about Mohammad Rizwan's performance that you know we also saw not only with this against South Africans, but also in the PSL. And you know, I think he's like in his phenomenal form. So I think all of these uh, working as a team against the Proteas, even though yes, 
and they surely the Proteus would definitely have the edge of the short ball and you know, that is one of the major troublemakers for Pakistan cricket players. How do you, how do you see that uh, helping uh, Proteus more because it's their home ground? Yeah, it's natural for every side. It was the same was true when the Proteas toured Pakistan as well. Obviously, Pakistan had a massive home ground advantage. We saw the spinners coming to play and we knew that that would happen. And we knew that South African spinners would not be able to um, match or compete in those same circumstances. And the same is true for our fast bowlers, right. for our opening bowlers. Obviously, the South Africans are specialized to their own backyard and they're going to take advantage of that. However, you mentioned Mohammad Rizwan and you talked about consistency. I am the biggest fan of consistency i think it makes a world of difference so what i am very confident about watching pakistan is seeing them keep a side that is core enough from the side that they've been playing over the last 18 months or so and that is massive for pakistan because we are a country we're a cricketing country that has lacked consistency for right. a very long time right. so it's nice to see the setup and the management believe in that and push forward with that you mentioned Mohammad Rizwan. I think he is maybe Pakistan's most important player, in all right. honesty. I, I know we've just spoken about Babur, but I think that Mohammad Rizwan is a really massive player for Pakistan and is going to be a player like that for a few years to come now. Right. Um, yes, he was amazing in the PSL. He was excellent in New Zealand, but this goes further back. Ever since Rizwan has been finally given the opportunity on an international stage, he has been continually impressing. He was great in England as well. So he seems to be a player... Um, the majority of players in the world are stronger in their backyard, like one would expect, just logically. Right. Mohamed Rizwan seems not to suffer from touring. He doesn't have the same yips or the same jitters that other players have. Right. Um, he takes responsibility incredibly well as an individual, and he takes mm -hmm. his cricket very seriously, but keeps it lighthearted enough that he keeps his players around him motivated. And because he's been such a strong part of this team, he's a player that the junior players, um, in terms of experience, age, everything, will be looking towards. He has assumed leadership seniority regardless of the fact that he hasn't been playing on an international sphere for that long. And that is going to be really powerful, powerful, excuse me, for Pakistan. South Africa's advantage with the short ball is, is absolutely undeniable. They've historically had bowlers who have always been able to utilize their conditions, just like most people can. Right. Um, and that's going to be really big for Pakistan. But that massive psychological push of what we just saw in the series that the two the two teams faced each other in is going to be there for Pakistan. And then obviously the advantages of having a side that's getting stronger and stronger. We've seen Fahim Ashraf um, continually impress as well, um, get stronger and stronger with every away tour. And I think that this is going to be the same for him. He Last time he toured South Africa, he, he didn't do too badly considering that it is a very difficult, notoriously difficult place to tour like New Zealand is. However, he impressed in both places. So I think the Pakistan side has all of the makings of, of incredible strength. I guess one of the main advantages is that with a shorter format, with, with ODIs and T20s, you have fewer challenges than test cricket with multiple sessions, multiple days, changing conditions can pose. So I just purely on, based on the fact that Pakistan will be playing ODIs and T20s, I think they will feel incredibly confident going into it. Yeah, looking forward for that. And talking about New Zealand, yes. Let's talk more about New Zealand versus Bangladesh. That's something that obviously is underway. And New Zealand is definitely leading 2-0. How do you see that improving their morale? Obviously, New Zealand is right now, I think, one of the most solid team for now. And they've been consistent as an overall team. So how did you see the, the, the two matches that actually they managed to win against the Bangladesh? I think they were actually very interesting games. Uh, the first game, as we know, Bangladesh did not really manage to turn up. We've seen it again and again with touring sides in COVID times. With isolation requirements, it seems to be taking a little bit longer or or the, the fear of more injuries. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned if I were a Bangladesh fan about the first game. I think they're looking like write-offs for the most part. Right. However, with the second game, Bangladesh really stepped up. Tamim Iqbal scored 70-something um, runs, and, and he was absolutely beautiful to watch, incredibly fluent. The exact type of player that we've known Tamim Iqbal to be right. over very many years, and he, he did manage to notch up his best score in the format against New Zealand, which was great to see. It means that we had a game, a genuine game, a genuine contest that went down to the last 10 balls, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. I do have a criticism, um, not necessarily of Bangladesh. I think they found themselves very much out of their depth. Like you mentioned, 
New Zealand are holistically strong. T20s, ODIs, test cricket, there seems to be nothing that this side can't do at the moment. True. And I, I've said this very many times, and I know to you as well, but I, I think a large part of that is the consistency. However, there have been a couple of changes in this series. Ross Taylor was injured. He will be coming back for the third game uh, from a hamstring injury, which will be nice to see. Captain Kane Williamson was injured. So there were a couple... Of, of things that New Zealand would have um, been less happy about or less comfortable with. However, they had an opportunity to test their bench strength against a side that is ranked number seven, where I think right. New Zealand are number three. It's a massive difference. Um, for me, New Zealand made a fair few mistakes. And then the real issue was that Bangladesh failed to capitalize on those mistakes, really exert pressure and take simple catches where they needed to be taken. Um, there were times where Tom Latham, who had an absolutely incredible 100-plus knock in the second ODI, there were times where he was playing incredibly slowly, where it was frustrating to watch, where you could see a little bit of pressure starting to build. However, the Bangladeshi bowlers were never able to, to um, extrapolate that same swing that Trent Bolt um, was able to, particularly in, in, in the first game. So I think it was a shame um, from a Bangladeshi perspective that opportunities were there and opportunities were missed. But one of the aspects that any Bangladesh fan should be looking at is that there was a massive improvement from the first game. Right. So I think the Bangladesh will hope to do the same for the third game. However, I do not think that New Zealand will be giving them the opportunities or the chances that right. they failed to take in the second game. So I, I, I see it as a clear-cut win. I, um, I spoke to a Bangladeshi outlet before this series started, and I made a very bold prediction of 3-0 which I think is, is not nice for any fan to hear I about agree. their side. But, right. but it's just the discrepancy that we have in the two teams before us. And as we all know, New Zealand is a notoriously difficult place um, to tour. We all look at it as green tops and we think, well, if these bowlers are taking 10 wickets, then we will be able to too. But that's not the case. Wickets are not being handed out for free. Right. You still have to put in the hard work and the miles and, and, and play with your bowling in order to be able to take those opportunities. Sadly for Bangladesh, they failed to do that. I presume that the third game, the final ODI, between the two sides will probably be a little bit um, similar to the second one. There'll be moments, there'll be if something it's, If thrilling. it's more struggling, obviously, as you've discussed earlier, Bangladesh will definitely try as they tried in the second match. And maybe if they manage to yeah. try it really, really hard, maybe they end up winning that match. It would be great to see. Yep. Sadly for Bangladesh, I don't I don't believe some of their strength comes from their spin. Um, this is not a country for spin. New Zealand um, has very few pitches where spin is successful. And where it is successful, it tends to be the best spinners in the world. The, those we consider to be real like gems in world cricket. We're talking about Nathan Lyon. We're talking about Yasser Shah. Right. Um, so I, I'm not entirely convinced that Bangladesh have the bowling resources required, the opening bowling particularly to overcome um, some of New Zealand's strengths, particularly Martin Guptill, who right. for me has a lot to prove. He is not done with his career. However, there are so many really excellent younger players that are knocking on that spot. So he really has a lot to show. He's not done yet, and he wants to have the opportunity to show people. Right. Um, he's a massive strength. He is a, a an underrated, absolutely classy, limited overs batsman and i think that he's going to do exactly what he did in the first game right. um and and just take it home with opening bowlers who are not penetrative enough to take those wickets at the top that's where the frustration really begins to mount for for um for touring sides right. so i think while i agree with you that with a little bit of grit and a little bit of determination even small people can can overcome giants Absolutely. i do think that new zealand have massive bench strength on their side. They have experience on their side. They have home ground advantage, and then they have the big discrepancy between how well-suited their bowling units are for yeah. these conditions I'll, as well. I'll just switch over instantaneously to the last question that I was thinking of discussing with you. A quick word on the PSL, and do you think the COVID-19 situation that we actually went into will come up to a conclusive side, and may we look forward to have that PSL in Pakistan again in June, July, whenever it was actually planned? I think that is a great question, and we have watched so much get taken away from us, not just in the world of sport, but in general. 
um, over the last year and a half. And the entire world has changed and we've all adjusted somewhat to the new normal. Right. However, we're now in a situation where all countries are beginning their vaccination programs right. and things are slowly starting to change. I think June is probably June, July um, is probably a good time of year to, to resume the right. PSL. I think the decision to suspend the PSL was brave, was intelligent and um, was very caring. Like I, I saw the PCB exhibiting true duty of care towards their players, their power professionals and everybody involved in the game with the decisions that they made. Um, right. I think putting blame on the circumstances of the fact that people are traveling from all over the world. Right. We This is a virus that can live on surfaces for a, a serious amount of time. So I don't think there's any need to place blame. Right. This is a situation that is going to come up in the in the world situation that we're in. So I actually think the PCB made a bold call, made an early call, and made the absolutely right call. It's a shame Perfect. for everybody involved. And let's in let's hope that. that you know we eventually come up to and PCB manages to uh, do this event soon. And hopefully, hopefully, we're looking forward for a great season of the PSL. Thank you very much, Tasim Samar Khan, for being with us on the show. Thank you, Alamdar. Pleasure. So that was the same. Obviously, we discussed a lot of things. Obviously, Pakistan cricket team going to South Africa. Not only that, we talked about uh, the New Zealand side more and, and the Bangladesh side, of course. It, besides that, we talked about the PSL. And let's hope things go well and the PSL continues by June. Anyways, I'll see you guys after the break. Welcome back, guys. And yes, we're talking cricket. Yes, I'll give a quick update with regards to West Indies versus Sri Lanka. Not to forget, the, the test is still underway. And Sri Lanka actually bowled out for 476 in their second innings. And Sri Lanka has set a target of 375 runs for West Indies to win the first test. The test will continue, and this is, not, this is only the first test, and then comes the second test. We'll surely talk more about that. But not only that, I want to switch over to the world of golf. Yes, we have with us in our studio, Bilal Tariq Khan, who's a national golf player. Bilal, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. So, Bilal, we'll talk about the WGC. The WGC has a lot of major upsets lately, ma major surprises. How did you see the entire prospect going further? And, you know, we can sh surely discuss the winners and the upsets. And we can start with just discussing the WGC. Uh, well, the World Golf Championships is one of the premier tournaments on the PGA Tour. Right. Uh, we've got four editions of the World Golf Championships taking place annually. Right. Uh, three in the U.S. and uh, actually two in the U.S., one in Mexico and one in China. Right. This one, uh, this format is played uh, not according to the stroke play index, but according to the match play. Right. It has a total prize money of $10.5 million. Right. And the top 64 players in the world are allowed to play and participate in this tournament. Right. So how do you... Anyways, um, when you talk about the top players, so it means that this is a major, major event. So talking about the top players, talking about Justin Thomas, and, and J Justin Thomas, not to forget, and obviously DeChambeau, they got a major surprise. Uh, everyone had a lot of hopes when they got to their victory. How do you see their performance? And you know, then we can switch over to Dustin Johnson, who actually managed to win it. Uh, well, I think it was a day of mixed results. Right. Uh, so we had, as you mentioned, we had the top seeds like uh, Dustin Johnson, who won his match against Adam Long. Right. We had the defending champion, uh, Kevin Kisner, who won his match against the South African, Louis Oistesen. Right. But then we had uh, big upsets as well. As you mentioned, Justice Thomas uh, yes. lost his match to Matt Kuchar. Absolutely. We had uh, Rory McIlroy, who lost his match to Ian Poulter. And... Uh, then you had Colin Morikawa winning the match. But coming back to uh, Rory McIlroy, uh, well, off late, Ke Rory McIlroy has been struggling through his swing. Right. Before coming into this tournament a week back, he changed his swing coach. And it's uh, good to recollect that the last time Rory McIlroy won on the World Tour was in China in uh, the WGC 2019 Championship, which took place in Shenzhen. Right. Um, Justin Thomas, one would have thought that coming into the tournament, he was very, very hot. Right. He just won the Players' Championship, which is long considered to be the fifth major right. uh, in the golf championships. But uh, also Matt Kuchar, who defeated Justin Thomas, he uh, was managed to uh, be, I think, the runner-up in the last championship that took place in Austin. Right. So we can't say that it was really an upset, but Matt Kuchar gave him a really tough time. He probably had five birdies carded in the first eight holes. Uh, Justin Thomas tried to claw his way back onto the back nine, but Matt Kuchar made it difficult. So how easy is it to make a comeback? Because obviously it's not a single day event. It's obviously, we've discussed this before as well, that it takes a while for someone to get there. But if anyone has that edge at the very start of the game, 
like for instance, the, the first day one, for instance, if they have an edge, how easy is, is, is it for them to maintain that? Uh, I think that's the important part about the match play championship. So in stroke play, right. you have the total aggregate score of a player who's carding it on in 18 holes on a daily basis. But in match play, you're playing against your opponent on a hole by hole basis. Right. So there's a lot of mental attitude which is involved in the match play championships. Uh, Matt Kuchar had a great start against Justin Thomas, had a few birdies. Uh, and the thing with match play is that once you have a very, very good start, it becomes very, very difficult for your opponent to claw his way back right. and, uh, you know, make birdies and eagles. So the only way you can do is that, you know, probably have expectations that the opponent might make a few mistakes and errors and then you could capitalize on those errors and then, you know, score some victories o over your opponent. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about, uh, you know, let's talk about the defending champion, you know, Kevin Kisner. Uh, he was obviously, as they all started, like you said, top 64 players. How was he performing this time for the fact that, you know, he obviously came up to that mark of proving his worth. But is, was he as close to J Dustin Johnson or not? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think a few interesting uh, facts that we need to narrate about Kevin Kisner first. Kevin Kisner is a resident of Texas. Right. Uh, so he's well versed within the area. Right. Kevin Kisner is the defending champion. In 2018, he again made his way to the finals, but he lost to Bubba Watson in the finals. Right. So he's well acclimatized with a golf club. Right. He knows the match play conditions, and otherwise he's known as a good match play, uh, match play player. Right, interesting. So, uh, but overall, you thought it was like a phenomenal uh, tournament for now? Oh, absolutely a phenomenal tournament, but I think one of the biggest surprises that we need to mention is... Uh, that uh, Dustin Bryson, Bryson DeChambeau, right. uh, he lost his match to a French player who was seeded number 63 coming into the tournament. Uh, and the interesting thing to note is that uh, the Grosvenor, the, the French player who participated, uh, 10 days before the tournament, he won the Qatar Masters. He made a 60-foot long putt on the 72nd hole on the Qatar, Qatar Masters, wow. which enabled him to qualify for this tournament only seven days back. Wow. And in the first match that he played against one of the most phenomenal players that we have in golf in the moment, Bryson DeChambeau, yeah. managed to win. Wow, that's, that's super. So that's, does luck have to do something with golf? <laughs> uh, I think <coughs> luck as well. And then you have to look at the form and uh, the way the player was coming into the tournament. This French player, he won two matches, two European two players uh, tournaments coming into the uh, WGC World Championship. So he won the Qatar Masters. And then a few weeks back, he won another tournament on the European Tour, which enabled him to qualify. Right. And then with his good form that he was coming into, he managed to defeat one of the soundest players on the Tour at the moment. So it, it seems very interesting for the fact that how they managed to qualify. I think definitely performing on the lower grades of golf tournaments, I guess that actually allows them to get into w WGC, right? Absolutely. So, you know, the thing with WGC is the format is different. Um, it just depends on how a golfer clicks on that particular day. Right. So that's why we had a lot of surprises because we saw a lot of results. In other results, we had Kevin Streelman defeat Victor Hovland, who is right. again one of the youngest but one of the hottest players on tours at the moment. And then we had Fratelli defeat Tony Finau, who is also one of the top tournaments. So it just depends on how a player conducts himself, whether he's clicking, where his swing is in alignment coming on that particular day. Right. Uh, your quick word on a Kenya Suwana event as well, that we would love the world to know about it too. So Kenya Savannah Tour is a tournament which is sanctioned on the European Tour. It has a prize money of around a million euros. Right. Uh, it's not one of the most sought after tournaments by the players, you know, who come and participate in the tournament. Uh, but the good thing to note is that it gives a lot of encouragement for the local African players to come and participate and then if they can, you know, right. perform well, right. then they can further head to the European Tour. But we had this Kenyan uh, David Vanku, I think, uh, who after two rounds is at a score of eight under par. But the guy leading the tour is uh, David Older, who is at 14 under par, and another Scottish, David uh, Dressler, who is at 12 under par at the moment. Well, interesting. Well, thank you so very much, Bilal, for the super updates with regards to the world of golf. Uh, we'll surely be having you again and again at our studios. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Anyway, so that major updates with regards to the world of golf. Now I quickly switch over to the world of football. Yes, we talk about Turkey beating Netherlands by 4-2 two, two actually in the, in, the, in, the, in the qualifier for the FIFA World Cup 2022. It was, uh, and you know, the interesting part is we still have hope that World Cup 2022 turns out to be phenomenal. Why? Because Turkey has actually managed to make their break. And Barak Yamaz actually scored hat-trick as Turkey cruised their way into the qualifying rounds. Anyways, that was the update with regards to the world of football. I'll quickly switch over to the world of NBA.
Yes, talking about the NBA, Toronto Raptors win against Denver Nuggets by 135 to 111 on Thursday. It is also interesting to know that Pascal actually dominated with 27 points, 8 rebounds and 6 assists. Toronto Raptors snapped the 9-game losing streak against the Nuggets. Well, this was the major updates with regards to the world of sports. Anyways, you guys can surely reach out to our social media handle, which is at the rate of Indus News Sport. That basically works for Twitter and Instagram. Till then, take good care of yourselves and bye-bye.